A very warm welcome to this uh, beautiful and historic church. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a vicar in the Church of England. I'm not the vicar of this church. I hasten to add um, it's George Bush who is hosting us, um, so to speak. My parish is in Islington. My name is Paul, Paul Zafiriu. Um, I'm the vicar of Hope Church Islington, which includes St. Mary Magdalene on Holloway Road and St. David, which is on Westbourne Road, very near Caledonian Road. Um, Just Share run a series of lectures. We're in a, a coalition, really, of churches that um, go right across denominations, so Anglicans and Catholics and Methodists and so on, and we're committed to global development and social justice, and the way we try to encourage this is through debates and lectures within the city, here most often, um, which are free, um, and there are leaflets available for the upcoming program. And do please stay afterwards. The format is there's going to be this talk, then we're going to have uh, time for Q&A in here, and then when the bells go for seven o'clock, that's the invitation for us to move outside, share a glass of wine or something else, and continue networking. Um, we have today Andy and Carol Kingston Smith, who are with us, which is wonderful. Welcome to you both. They've come from Gloucestershire, and um, they have founded something called the Justice Initiative. I was looking at their website. I strongly commend it to you. And they're going to speak to us about inequality and farce in contemporary Britain, reflections from the medieval carnival and the biblical concept of shalom. So there's plenty for us to, uh, to grapple with there. Um, they love looking at sort of the interdisciplinary um, way in which mission can happen. So you... Um, and for me, I was just explained to them as, um, as a vicar in a 21st century church in um, inner city London, this is something absolutely key for us. And thinking with others how we can collaborate, how we can train, and how we can apply rubber to the road. Andy grew up in um, Chile, a missionary family, and then trained as a solicitor and uh, practiced for a number of years. Um, Carol grew up um, in Brazil, in the jungles of Brazil, in her early years before completing a master's in nursing and coming to the UK. And they've been involved in something called Latin Link. If you want to know more about that, please do talk to them afterwards. Um, spent quite a lot of time in La Paz, in Bolivia, working with street children and also heavily involved in a church there. But now they are at Redcliffe College, which is in Gloucestershire, um, lecturing in mission and in justice and um, again I was on the website there um, some really interesting resources things that encourage us to think through um, the role of Christianity in um, the 21st century social context um, they're partnering with uh, justice mission in developing a course that looks at that um, and uh, they have four children um, so I'm really thrilled to welcome you. Um, I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this evening over the last several weeks. And so without further ado, um, Carol and Andy, would you come up and um, give us what you want to have us hear? Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be here today. Um, we, do, we try and do quite a few things together. We had four children together, and we're trying to do this justice initiative together. So the way we'll be formatting this evening is I will begin, and then Andy will continue. So um, bear with us. So our topic is looking at inequality and farce in contemporary Britain, using in particular reflections from the medieval carnival and the biblical concept of shalom. This theme is something that's in um, our book, which we've brought uh, this evening and will be available for sale. So if you want to engage a little bit more with it, please help us after that at the end at tea. In this lecture, we will firstly explore connections between the me medieval carnival and biblical pr principles of social justice by examining in particular the three themes of social inversion, laughter, and the banquet. Secondly, in the light of these connections, we will seek to stimulate a hopeful, critical, and applied dialogue with socioeconomic inequality in contemporary Britain. I want to begin this exploration with reference to the call that Jesus makes on our lives to enter the kingdom as children, because I believe there's a deeper wisdom in this gateway than we often allow ourselves to explore. 
One of the quintessential abilities that makes us human is the development of the theory of mind. By this, I mean being able to infer the full range of mental states, beliefs, desires, intentions, imagination, emotions, etc., that predispose and cause actions in the real world. In short, having a theory of mind enables us to reflect on the contents of our own and others' minds and to at least attempt to link that with actions we take in the real world. There is a defining moment in early childhood when the young child begins to develop the capacity to entertain ideas that are different from current reality as they've experienced it. We call this development of imagination. This developmental milestone is fundamental to many aspects of child's unfolding thought processes. Children between the ages of two and three begin to think counterfactually. That is, in terms of what if or supposing that. And in doing so, they are conjuring with thoughts about what might happen or even about what could never really happen. By the age of four, typically, developing children will demonstrate the capacity to imagine or understand the mental states, i.e. the thoughts, beliefs, and feelings of other people. To do so, they must recognize that another person's belief about a situation may not be the same as their own or indeed as the reality of the situation. Importantly to our topic today, current theories about imagination in children emphasizes the central and interrelated roles of imaginative capacities in the development of advanced social and cognitive skills which contribute to the corporate maturation of society. I want to invite you to consider that as we approach the theme of the medieval carnival, you might consider its function in part as a reinvigoration of the corporate social imagination. That is the flexing of society's corporate theory of mind and its ability to think counterfactually, which can then enable the rehearsal of alternative role play experiments of reality and allow for the exploration of alternative perspectives, beliefs, feelings, etc. We might say that this corporate flexing of imagination helps to move society away from its rigid fixations with the way things are and invites it rather to imagine the way things could be. In a similar way, I propose the biblical prophetic imaginative thread draws us out beyond the fixations of ego to peep through the veil of revelation towards a landscape of which lies beyond the plane of critical consciousness. This land where the fullness of material and spiritual salvation, represented by water, wine, and milk, are freely available. And this is a reference to Isaiah 55. And a land where the predatory hierarchies of self-preservation, which are depicted in Isaiah chapter 11, are no longer necessary to survival. The land where human flourishing is equitable and does not prejudice the flourishing of the whole of the rest of creation. Philosopher Paul Ricoeur describes the shift from early stages of naivety, which depends somewhat on ignorance, through the wilderness of the rational cynical development to the second naivety. And this is the stage of human maturity where experienced reason once again opens itself up to the creativity of imagination and the enchantment beyond the horizon of the known. With a slightly different emphasis, French philosopher and Christian mystic Simone Weil speaks of the decentered self, which gladly submits without fear to the revelatory power and ecstasy of beauty perceived. This beauty is conceived by the Christian as the revelation of God's imminent and glorious presence which induces what we describe as kenotic or self-emptying longing to be recreated in his likeness. Thus, this second stage of our journey towards God and at the same time towards the rest of humanity and creation becomes less selfish and more selfless, less fearful and more trusting, less about holding on and more about letting go, less about us and more about the other. So as we come to consider the lessons and parallels of the medieval carnival with kingdom life, it's worth remembering these observations of human development, which both integrate and mature our human action in the world. Turning to the carnival, the carnival 
was at its heart a revolutionary and alternative view of reality, a way of representing, if only for a short time, a new reality in which the present order was turned on its head in favor of those from the underside of history, the peasant, the poor, in short, the non-elite. As such, the carnival represents a creative interplay between the way things are, that is the present status quo, which for many of the time was harsh and oppressive, and the way things could be. This envisioning interpretation and enactment, if only at the time of carnival, was an alternative energy, and this reality was conceived at the interface between the stasis imposed from above and the desire for change from below, between the old and the new, the official and the unofficial. The carnival became a showcase of this alternative conception of power from below, where the elite power holders of the day were clownishly aped by the costume peasants. Grand public carnival feasts were held to mimic civic ceremonies, uncrown the gentry elite and crown the peasant instead. Humor, satire, dramatic enactment, feasting and laughter were all core elements of this time of festive revolutionary imagination. For a short time, the carnival was a celebration which leveled all in a grand mockery of pomp and status and also of peasant baseness at one and the same time. But it also carried more subtle themes, such as the exposure of the inside panel of the cloth of culture, the exposure of those things commonly hidden and unseen, which became unseamed and exposed in caricature. The carnivalesque revealed the fabric of our, the society which was found to be wanting. In short, the carnival deeply critiqued both religious and civil structures which had become oppressive to the non-elite majority. Whilst we might stand aside from the extreme libertinism and debauchery embedded in the car carnival, I believe we can also find some helpful pointers in its passionately creative contestations against patterns of injustice, which are still so often lining the fabrics of our cultures. The carnival invites us to be bold and to dare to turn our cultural clothes inside out and examine carefully the workmanship and the fabric of our families, our institutions, our economic paradigms, in short, the whole of society. Like the developmental surge of early imagination which propels the developing young mind into the next stage of maturation, the carnival opens up an imaginative window and invites an engagement with the other possibilities of ordering human society. Similarly, the prophetic depictions of the fully presenced reign and rule of God is presented to us through scripture as an upside-down kingdom radically different to the status quo of earthly kingdoms where power and prestige can coalesce in the hands of a few at the expense often of the majority. At the heart of the vision of the reign of God is the belief that this reign will result in shalom. The, this shalom describes the delightful and convivial energy of a community at one and at peace with itself and in purposeful service to God and the greater good of the rest of creation. Nicholas Walterstorff, in his recent book, Hearing the Call, Liturgy, Justice, at the Church and the World, notes that the attributes of Shalom as being the absence of hostility and the highest enjoyment of relationships with God, with oneself, with others, and with the environment. The prophet Isaiah depicts this joy-filled state as living in the tranquil country, dwelling in shalom in houses full of ease. Shalom ultimately speaks of an extraordinary flourishing which lies beyond the reconciliation of all things, a dramatic shift in the relational patterns of the community of creation. So with this visionary backdrop of the future community of shalom, I want to turn now to place and examine a few ways in which the prophetic impulse moved the people towards the fulfillment of that vision. Central to Jesus' teaching of the kingdom is his continuity with prophetic tradition, which promotes a social corrective mechanism, which is also prominent in the medieval carnival, as we've discussed. And this theme is that of social inversion. This parody of social inversion is typified 
as we've described as the peasant becoming lord for the day and the lord becoming a peasant. Each parodying in their role play the farce of the excesses of the other state. In both the Old and New Testaments, we're reminded that prideful excess of the rich and powerful will be exposed and brought low, while the poor and the oppressed will be raised up. Mary, the mother of Jesus, inspired by the imaginative hope of a renewed and just society seeded in the Old Testament scriptures, rejoiced that the Lord God had scattered those who were proud and brought down rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble and filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Jesus echoes these sentiments, sentiments in his own words and actions many times during his course of ministry, reminding us once again that the kingdom is one which scatters and brings low the proud and lifts up the humble in a radical reordering of society into egalitarian and just relationships fundamental to the kingdom where the delight of shalom can rest. But the carnival does not induce hatred or violence, but rather laughter, our second theme from the medieval carnival. In contradistinction to the formal seriousness of the feudal elite, which according to the Russian philosopher and literary theorist Michael Bakhtin, the only tone fit to express the true, the good, and all that was essential and meaningful was this tone of seriousness. Carnival laughter, on the other hand, is highly nuanced and subversive, capable of producing spaces of freedom and hope under tyranny and adversity, encouraging the imagining, the envisioning, and enacting of a way of life beyond the limitations and absurdities of the current unjust status quo. Laughter released the implicit humor of unpicking rigid social and political structures and disemboweling and exposing the truths which are indeed often stranger than fiction and which are often hidden behind the pretense of well-used scripts of power. Laughter is so powerful that the humorist author Mark Twain is said to have acknowledged it as the human race's only effective weapon. Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educationalist and philosopher, speaks of maturational laughter and he parallels the development of human maturity noting that in order to move society towards deeper and broader emancipation, humanity must push forward to the third and final state of human consciousness, which he describes as critical consciousness. Might the Apostle Paul also be referring to this when he speaks of the renewing of our minds in Romans chapter 12? Freire notes that both naive and superstitious or cynical consciousness both fail to transform it's only when mature and reflective engagement born out of critical consciousness pushes us, uh, pushes us out beyond the relative inaction of what he calls the cynical or ironic postmodern laugh that we then can begin to enjoy the pedagogy of happiness, laughter, of questioning or curiosity, of seeing the future through the present, a pedagogy that believes in the possibility of the transformation of the world. The political theologian Luke Bretherton proffers that the carnival laughter both mocks the madness of the world unredeemed and reminds us that in order to understand and enter into the true joy and celebratory laughter of the resurrection, we first need to understand the nature of chaos and laugh at it for the grotesque distortion that it actually is. Acton, in his extraordinary analysis of medieval laughter in the writings of Rabelais, goes further to emphasize that laughter, in fact, embodies deep philosophical meaning, which is one of the essential forms of truth concerning the world as a whole, concerning history and man. It is a particular point of view relative to the world. The world is seen anew, no less, and perhaps more, profoundly than what was seen from the serious standpoint Certain essential aspects of the world are accessible only to laughter, says Bacton. For the Christian, this Easter laughter is a legitimate bursting forth of a viscerally experienced and newly awakened relief born out of a new vision into a new reality. A resurrection of hope in regeneration, which lies at the heart of the good news of the kingdom of God. As such, it is wholly appropriate laughter. Most powerfully, Easter laughter celebrates what Bakhtin refers to as the return of abundance and justice for all people. A new resurrection awareness 
which Bakhtin continues, had found its most radical expression in laughter, a laughter which, he concludes, does not deny seriousness, but purifies and completes it, purifies it from dogmatism, from the intolerant and the petrified. It liberates from fanaticism and pedantry, from fear and intimidation, from didacticism and naivety and illusion. The scope of vision of this resurrection laughter releases strength to rebuild and restore places and cities long devastated. As such, in the same way in which Jesus presenced his kingdom on earth by tackling unjust powers at work to oppress, by exposing these powers publicly, so also laughter exposes the nonsense of injustice and turns it inside out in a sort of confessional liturgy which unpicks the cloth of unjust power and caricatures their ultimate impotence. Jesus promoted the characteristics of the kingdom community through his envisioning teaching and parables which inspired hope in his hear hearers. In the same way, laughter can release hope conceived as it is around the seed of a vision of a new way of living which bursts forth beyond the restrictions of the life as it is. In a powerful way, laughter can breach petty rules of legalism and break open a new liturgical space in which the imagination, inspired by the seeds of kingdom joy, can recreate the divine perichoresis, that is, the divine dance of unity, which unifies the story of justice. So then, firstly, carnival laughter derides power of injustice under the eschatological premise that the powers of this age are indeed passing away. Psalm 2 notes that he who sits in heaven laughs, the, whole, the Lord holds them in derision. But secondly, laughter liberates the vision of the just community of the carnival kingdom. It recognizes and denounces, according to the political theologian Luke Bretherton, the pretensions of power and the tendency of the church, the state, and the academy to self-aggrandizement to the point of idolatry and reveals them for what they are, foolishness. Laughter also carries a liberating birthing and envisioning function, and in the community of the kingdom, laughter releases strength to build a new world which takes courage to establish and tenacious creativity to maintain. But thirdly, at its core, Carnival Laughter announces that justice has come, and in this way, it has an indissoluble and essential relation to freedom. The final theme of Carnival, which I want to highlight in relation to our examination of its message to the challenges of contemporary inequality, is that of the banquet. The banquet brings together the themes already discussed, of solidarity and social equality and laughter, around a table of provision and plenty a banquet for the entire world. The banquet is a fitting culmination for the work of justice, plentiful provision in a community for all. In her book, A Place at the Table, Justice for the Poor in a Land of Plenty, Judith Ann Brady makes the theme of A Place at the Table a guiding metaphor for achieving justice for the poor and oppressed. The table represents friendship, provision, and nurture, and it also represents inclusivity and agency in that all who sit at the table can join in the conversation and the decision making which flows from that table. For the people of faith working for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, there are two stages of the biblical banquet feast. The first, the Eucharist, anticipates the second, the wedding feast of the Lamb. In his final celebration of the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus links the liberation story of the people from slavery in Egypt with his own work of liberation and justice as king of the new kingdom. Bakhtin notes that the carnival banquet always contained an element of victory and triumph, which provides the symbolic pause between the celebration and completion of one cycle of labor for justice and the invigorated new beginning of another cycle of labor for justice. For the people of Israel, the Passover feast was a somewhat hurried celebration of an era, an end of an era of slavery forced work, which marked and energized a new beginning as the called out and liberated people of Yahweh. Even as we work for his justice and shalom, we need to remind ourselves frequently 
for as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, that both the lament and suffering of the whole of creation which groans, and also of the joy and thankfulness of the freedom we can taste in anticipation of the new heavens and the new earth. The Eucharist is truly food and sustenance for this journey, and in addition, it marks out and reminds us that there is also material provision in true fellowship. The second biblical focus on the banquet theme is that of the marriage feast of the Lamb, noted in Revelation. This banquet is the ultimate celebration and the closure of all cycles of work for justice of God's kingdom. It acknowledges, interestingly, both the work of Jesus and of all those who have taken up their cross and followed him. We note it says, Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And then noted by the writer that fine linen stood for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Bacton notes that the additional power of the wedding feast imagery, where the two epilogues of a feast and a wedding bring about a cycle of completion, which opens the door to the potentiality of a new beginning instead of the abstract and bare ending. For the person of faith, the Eucharist is a symbolic feast which celebrates these repeated cycles of work for justice through Jesus Christ, yet it also points beyond the immediate travail for God's kingdom and recognizes in solidarity with all who suffer that there will come a time when the permanent and outrageous plenty of the wedding feast will replace the transitory nature of the Eucharist feast. This marks beyond the move beyond slavery to the fallen powers of the world's unjust systems, towards the liberation and laughter of the pilgrim communion and feasting. Importantly, too, the banquet table also reminds us of the concrete value of our, eternal, uh, of our material lives. When we consider a world where hunger and starvation remain all too common, where food prices are soaring, and where even those in developed nations like ourselves are increasingly having to rely on the charity of food banks in order to put food on our tables. The metaphor of the banqueting table of the carnival kingdom is a profoundly prophetic one. It reminds us that what blocks the meeting of basic human needs and flourishing also blocks the coming of the kingdom. This banquet table reminds us to work, that the work for justice, of provision of the material well-being for all of humanity, but it also reminds us to open our lives to the hospitality of the kingdom, which calls us to share so that those who have little have enough and that those who have much have less. For the redistribution economics of the Carnival Kingdom are also a powerful reminder of our ultimate place within the context of a human family of faith. So I conclude, so to conclude, I suggest that these three themes highlighted of social inversion, laughter and banquet from the medieval carnival work in synergy to promote an alternative vision of reality which at least in part mirrors the scriptural prophetic vision. Andy will now turn to consider how we might begin to apply some of these insights to the task of being imaginatively conscious in the 21st century. So I'm going to make some further comments on the concept of inequality. Uh, I will share some general thoughts and ideas uh, just to try and open up some discussion in a few minutes' time. Um, but before we start, uh, perhaps a disclaimer. Um, a lot of what we share may not be very easy to swallow. It may not be very popular. Um, and we will be the first to say that our own attitudes and apathy are things that we continually look to challenge. So like you, I do hope that uh, we're all on a journey to rediscover things that have been lost and restore the years that the locust has eaten. When we consider inequality, three issues in Britain stand out to me. Firstly, the growing gap between rich and poor, reflected through the lack of economic well-being, housing, social welfare, opportunities generally. Secondly, the shift away from a compassionate, genuinely democratic and egalitarian society where we are governed increasingly by the politics of the elite leading to a crisis of democracy. And thirdly, there appears to be a heightened disconnect between aspiration and opportunity, be that through lost vision in our education system or the insecurity of the labor market. 
There seems to be a growing disconnect between politics as offered by our three major parties, and I'm discounting UKIP's protest vote voice and the recent success in riding the immigration wave, and also the Green Party's slow rise in consciousness, which is yet to be represented or publicized meaningfully in mainline media. And secondly, social politics from below. By that I mean the ordinary person on the street. A trawl through social media highlights this. In example, for example, climate change and global warming, these issues continue to stare us starkly in the face and the situation is continually uh, continue to deteriorate rapidly. And yet 99% of global scientists are united in their conclusions, yet somehow we still get mixed messages in the press and our government has reneged on its promise to be the greenest government of all time. The fracking debate is a specific example where the opportunity to develop renewable energy sources in our windy land is sabotaged by ongoing extractive processes. However, I don't wish to focus on such political debates. Rather, I'm wanting to highlight principles that need to guide us in recognizing the injustice of the increasing economic inequality that we face today. I have been following the recently formed Inequality Briefing Network, and it seems to me that many of the issues highlighted there find enlightenment in the Jubilee Principles of Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 15. We can't explore these now in any detail, but I would refer you to the work of the Jubilee Center in Cambridge if you're not familiar with them. It seems to me that what we are crying out for is the reversal of the ongoing obsession with growth at all costs, the economic mantra of the mainstream parties in our current system. We need to redeem the very notion and practice of economics, the idea of oikonomia, where a self-sustaining household budget was set and managed by the extended family. The idea is that man money and economic management is a tool that we utilize and master rather than become mastered by, by it. And this is done in small, local, interdependent, and decentralized manners. We may protest that this all sounds rather impractical in a globalized world, not least if it means we have much to give up. But that's the whole point of God's blueprint for society, as so wonderfully provided for in these Old Testament provisions. Living with and for each other means that the privileged have to give up wealth and use it for the benefit of society. Unless we have the vision for an alternative way of living, one that is personable, seeks the welfare of the poorest, is interdependent and sustainable, and operates above all by God's idea of social justice, never mind good governance and creation care, and more critically, unless we are prepared to make the sacrificial costs to model this for ourselves, things won't change. As Dr. Zeus's The Law Act says, and I quote, unless someone like you, us, I would add, cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. So the key question, why does inequality matter so much? This is a key dynamic that the carnival sought to reverse, if only for a day. It is one of the underlying principles behind the Jubilee as a corrective to inequality. Without wishing to be overly simplistic in referring us right back to sin and the fall, there are a number of fallouts that make it so dangerous. Inequality is actually a bad issue economically, as well as socially and politically, never mind morally and theologically. Male and female were created equally, the sun shines on the rich and poor alike, and criminal justice is meted out impartially on both the rich and the poor. However, inequality is also acknowledged and corrected. Jesus laments the existence of the poor amongst us, not in a pragmatic, accept this is reality kind of way, but for the very reason that we need to address it, as the Jubilee Principles were designed to do. I have already referred to these corrective principles but we may also wish to consider the concept of God's bias to the poor, popularized in particular by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and liberationist theologians. The levelers in 17th century Britain understood it. They recognized the systemic inequality created and maintained by differences in social class. The Occupy movement of recent years understands it. The injustice of inequality 
resulting from the financial crisis which burdens the poor at the expense of propping up the wealthy financial sector. Jonathan Ingleby, in his chapter in the book, Carnival Kingdom, uh, he looks at the issue of justice, of equality, to, and he tackles some of the realities offering theological insights in greater depth, both from a biblical perspective and that of the underside of history, framing it through a post-colonial lens. Wilkinson and Pickett's book called The Spirit Level and Daniel Dawling's book Injustice are two recent books that cover social equality in much greater depth. Tony Judd's Ill Fares the Land states that, quotes, it is the growing inequality in and between societies that generates so many social pathologies. Grotesquely unequal societies are also unstable societies. They generate internal division and sooner or later internal strife, usually with undemocratic outcomes. Ulrich Ducro also provides a masterful critique of the excesses of the capitalist system in an article published in Reckless Encounters Journal a couple of years back. So what are the alternatives, and how do we seek to respond? Very briefly, I offer three pathways, all of which are not exactly popular, but in my view, necessary for the community of Christians to seriously consider. Firstly, we should consider very carefully whether we are called to downward mobility. This is perhaps more of an issue for those born or acquiring privilege and wealth. Secondly, and more accessible to most of us, is a return to localism. And thirdly, the endorsement of simpler living. These last two can go hand in hand. The joy of growing your own ve vegetables, exchanging goods and services within your community, and giving sober thought to those wants versus needs desires all help to recalibrate some of our entitlement conceptions. None of this is new. It is simply that the world we face today in 21st century Britain demands a bolder and more courageous response from the followers of Jesus' way. This is not a pathway to success as commonly understood, but rather a pathway to generous living. The rediscovery of conviviality and community where the small, simple pleasures of life are enhanced and our slavery to time and wealth gain are diminished. This is why Jeremy Williams' Make Wealth History blog is such a genius title, if rather mocking. We're called increasingly back to the circular economy away from the linear one, which is headed towards the precipice. The circular economy may not make us millionaires, but it will make us happier, and more importantly still, it will put Britain back on the road to being what it was always good at, a more egalitarian, justice-conscious society that has the welfare of its poorest citizens at heart. The last 30, 40 years have seen a reversal of that. As Gandhi once said, that is the measure of a moral society. The Transition Town Movement offers an excellent example of ways in which we can engage meaningfully. And if you're not familiar with the Transition Town Movement, we can uh, ch chat a little bit about that or you can ask some questions. Finally, only then can the community of believers really start to reverse the farce of growing inequality in Britain today. Thank you. So, questions? Thank you very much. Sorry, Stephen Nishal is my name. I live in South London. Thank you very much for such a uh, rich and imaginative um, um, thoughts about our present situation. I just wondered, uh, let's think about your localism and equality, uh, and wondered if it immediately sprung, connected with me in, in discussions uh, about virtue ethics, the Aristotelian idea, uh, and, and you actually use one of Aristotle's kind of concepts of the, the household economy and the, you know, the roots of that word. I wondered if you've got any thoughts on those connections. You mean thinking in terms of local approaches to the economy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the trend... Right. The Transition Town Movement uh, provides some ex excellent examples of this. Um, for example, um, a local currency. In fact, there is one in, in, in London, the Brixton Pound, you may have come across. Uh, there's a Stroud Pound and the Bristol Pound and various other ones. And the idea is essentially that uh, goods and services are circulated within the local community rather than drained out into the globalized economy. 
Um, I think one of the issues that um, many commentators and, and academics are challenging with the current system is that uh, everything is boiled down to finance, the idea of the concept of financialization. So, um, and that is, if you like, the domain of the global economy. Uh, the idea of the local economy is to ensure that that drain doesn't occur and that uh, we get back to really what trade should be all about, which is the exchange of goods and services within the community for the benefit of, of all of those uh, there. So uh, other examples could be uh, using, you know, developing allotments and growing our own food, exchanging that for other services. Um, the idea that, of course, we all benefit from each other's skills and therefore exchange what we have and don't have. Um, so the transition town movement does have some really excellent uh, and in very imaginative ways. One of the challenges, uh, particularly perhaps thinking about London, is you know, this is a, an urban context, a large urban context, and much of the transition town movement uh, lends itself perhaps more obviously to semi-rural or small cities. Um, having said that, uh, there are many initiatives like growing uh, gardens on, on the top of high-rise buildings. I mean, there are things that are happening in London I've seen as well. So I think a lot of it goes back to imagination and, and will. You know, if we are prepared to think about ways of doing things in an alternative way, um, I think that's a very positive response. And it may be that Carol wants to draw on that at all, I don't know. Yeah, just briefly, connecting the idea of the virtue element um, is that localism obviously re commits you to local integrity in a way that globalized economy doesn't. And I think that's the, one of the important uh, things to remember, that where, where there's accountability within local systems of exchange and so on, there's a greater consciousness of the impact on both environment and consumer and supplier and so on. So in terms of the virtue of building a society that's growing in virtue, that, that's a very important one to note. Thank you very much. Other questions? Um, my name is Peter West. Uh, I used to live in London. I now live in North Bedfordshire in a village. So uh, um, one of the things that struck me when you were talking about the medieval carnival and the elements of sort of turning the world upside down is how many of those elements are there in the Christmas story. Um, and that set me reflecting that in the village that, uh, that we now live in, um, the Christmas story is celebrated in such a way that... Um, seems to me to sort of insulate itself from real life in the way that you kind of hinted the medieval carnival. You know, you can turn the world upside down for a day, uh, but don't you dare think of turning the world upside down the rest of the time, almost. Um, and I suppose I, I started thinking of a way in which, with our local church, we could perhaps celebrate Christmas more uh, with a sense that it did give people the idea that they could imagine and actually do something about a different kind of world. Um, that's a question. I'd, I'd quite like some help from you in, in thinking a bit more about that. I'm trying to find the question in there. Um, are you, are you, are you, is your question asking for reflections on how you could do that? Or, yes, okay. I mean, you, you sound like you've begun an imaginative journey, which... Um, wouldn't be for me to interrupt. I'm sure that God will begin to lead you and open up what that might look like. But you're absolutely right. I think it's very easy for us to begin to insulate the sheer dynamite of the, the powerful message at the heart of, of the gospel story, the birth of Jesus, but also the cross and so on. Because the cross was the ultimate inversion. It was the ultimate inversion of life and death and the resurrection, obviously, followed on from that. But, um, yeah, I, I think that's a very important thing, to de-insulate the, the Christmas story would be a great project, and we'd be really interested to see how you do that with your community. Uh, but I can't think on the spot here how you might begin to do that, but it certainly would begin somewhere along the lines of actually um, taking it out of the stable into the, the world that we inhabit now in some way and beginning to connect what that looked like and what that meant in that time and an hour as Vicar's always looking for new ideas. I love what you said. We have, um, we have a family in our, in our congregation. Um, they don't give one another Christmas presents at all. And so at Christmas, they give presents to others. They collect the money that we have spent on themselves, and they turn it around, and they bless people in their community with it. 
and they say we're doing, you know, it's Christmas and that's why we're doing this. Um, but to have, uh, I think, um, a more structured story in any parish around Christmas and to bring that as, a, as an example gets me really excited. Um, yeah, Christmas is great when it comes around, but it can also be arid um, today, and uh, we do need to break out of that. So thank you very, very much. I, I, I had a kind of reflection as we were talking about, um, about Carnival and about how it um, turns things upside down, and this has already been referred to briefly, how you can turn things upside down for a day, um, but the sustainability of a carnival that just, you know, turns everything upside down kind of forever, because we are then going to start skirting with the fallenness that is in our nature, and even the upside down world, after a while, will become an establishment world, won't it? So we need, I think, to be, I don't know whether you've reflected on that, how you have. I mean, I think one example which I mentioned, actually, which is very helpful here, is the, the, are the Jubilee principles, because um, they envisage, envisage a situation which cannot go on forever. So in the 49th year, uh, or after 49 years, in the 50th year, the land is returned back to the original owner. So what happened is that, uh, as you're hinting, human nature is such that things go wrong. Um, the opportunists, the wealthy, the skilled take advantage. Uh, those who run into financial difficulties feel they have to sell, feel they have to sell their land. And it's, it's not long before you get a, a situation where uh, the land that was equally parceled out starts to become condensed, uh, sorry, um, uh, it, it becomes grouped you know, into, the, into the hands of a few. Um, but the provisions of the, of the Jubilee reverse that by saying in the 50th year that's all reverted back, that's all changed, that's all cancelled, and it goes back to how things were originally intended by God, which was a, an equal pass of land for everybody. And the same with slavery, the cancellation of debts as well, the setting of slaves free. So um, those provisions are incredibly powerful because they remind us that the way things are don't have to be like that in perpetuity. Things can be changed and, and need to be changed because uh, human nature uh, won't often do that for the right reasons. Um, and that's the whole issue of the status quo and the need to, to turn things upside down from time to time. So um, those provisions are incredibly powerful and I think they always therefore give hope. You know, if, if one had to be sold into slavery, there was hope that in a few years' time that situation will come to an end. If you get into debt, you know that your debt will be cancelled. If you have sold your land, you know you'll get it back. So um, those provisions are incredibly uh, powerful for today. Yeah, just briefly, just to respond to the, the idea of just for a day, um, it's very true, and I think critics of, of, of the carnival would, would note that it actually was um, an institutionally permissible, because the church actually permitted the carnival, and the state permitted it. So some historians would say, well, actually, it was just like a release valve, a cathartic release valve, and so on, and would say, well, you know, what good will that achieve in the longer term, and so on, and that's all absolutely right. Um, I think what it does do, though, is it fires um, an experimentation with the imagination of, well, why, what are we so angry about against the elites? And what are the angry elites angry about with the peasants? And it begins to just uh, challenge what, what those things are and bring them out to the open. But groups, for example, such as the levelers, were far more, uh, they, they put their spades to work, so Carnival wasn't going to answer any problems if it was just for a week or a day, and they took their spades out and started digging up and planting potatoes on land that, that they felt should be, be farmed for the use of local people. So I'm not saying in any way that the Carnival is, is the end, but I think it does just raise some important things for us to think through. Um, in terms of just reimagining what, and that's what was at the heart of it, let's reimagine what things could be like. But yes, we then need to then take that forward in a practical way. Sort of, I'm struggling a bit with this one. I always do with it. I don't want to push you too far on the localism bit because I realise that's just a fraction of your sort of thinking and I think the whole carnival principle is much bigger than the localism. Um, just an interesting throwaway comment there before I ask my question was that there is, of course, some considerable doubt whether the Jubilee principles were ever actually applied. 
um, you know, whether that they're any more than an idea, which is another fascinating question. But what, what I was going to really ask, if, if you just sort of stick with the localism at the moment, the problem I always have with it, of course, is that s many of the truly good developments of our, our life, the technological developments, are not really uh, imaginable uh, coming out of that sort of local context because they do actually require concentrations of, of um, capital, whether it be financial capital or intellectual capital um, or um, political capital that goes well beyond the local. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm not sure I caught all that you were saying at the end. Um, Saying that some of the truly, uh, there are really important uh, technological developments in our life. If you think more the medical things, which are, are true goods in our life, they have required um, resources of economic, political, and intellectual capital, which one can't imagine coming out of a purely localized setup. In other words, if we if we created localism now. Um, in that truly accountable way, which has got so many um, appealing features in terms of accountability, Global local control. control. Where would that continuing um, capital come from for the bigger things, mm. the bigger enterprises? Um, there's a concept called globalization which is this kind of marrying of, uh, of the global and the local. Um, the idea that um, you've heard the expression, act, act lo um, think globally, act locally, or not other way around. Um, I, I think partly what we were sharing is um, trying to get to think through the excesses of the system um, and the fact that uh, there are many aspects of globalization or of the global order that, that can be good, um, and it's not that everything's uh, irredeemable. Um, it's trying to find a, a a more equitable balance, I think, between um, the, the excesses that are going on, and particularly the uh, trajectory we're on, which is just continuing uh, inequality gap is getting bigger and bigger, and I've got a lot of things I downloaded from the inequality briefing, um, which sort of back this up, but th this uh, worry that um, you know, things are just continuing to, to get out of kilter. Um, and I think localization is acknowledging um, the, the, the good in the global as well as the good in the local and then somehow trying to marry the two together if that's possible. Uh, I think it is. Um, it's partly the experiment, not experiment, but the, the move towards regionalization and localism, which is kind of resurfacing in many places or aspects of um, reaction against globalization that people want to feel that decisions are made for them that are meaningful in their own context um, rather than bureaucrats in, in Brussels making decisions that, that, that have nothing to do with them. So I don't know if that really answers the question. I mean, Carol, I think was going to say something about technology, perhaps, with uh, Walterstorff. But um, yeah, it, it's trying to, I think it's, it's trying to get away from the old dichotomies and trying to find new hybrid uh, forms of, of, of finding uh, positive responses. And, that, and hybridity is one response where you get a marrying of, of good aspects of other, of a, of a number of things. Yeah, I mean, Nicholas Walterstorff, who I referred to in my particular talk, um, American philosopher, and educationist, he, he talks about the Amsterdam School, um, creationism school, that looks at technological advances in furthering justice for humankind and so on in a positive light. Um, but his emphasis is always that there is a, a suitable um, body to monitor the impact of that advancement at a local level as well as a global level, so that it's not just um, power coalescing, if you like, and, and advantaging a small minority of the world, but that it's actually genuinely being, it's about d distribution economics again. So it's about what's happening globally, what's resourced globally, but how is that then distributed locally and how it's impacting local communities? Yeah, that's, help, that's helpful, thanks. So if I Google globalization, that'll lead me in the right direction. So yeah, thanks very much. I think it's gone seven o'clock, so um, I'm going to suggest that we continue the dialogue um, outside, if that's all right with all of you. I want to wave a tiny banner for the Church of England, because um, with the Archbishop's uh, position 
on uh, the role of money, on credit, on credit unions. Um, there's a, we were chatting a little bit earlier, just before we started, on, uh, on the, we feel maybe there's a new wave of the spirit encouraging the church to look really seriously at issues of money and debt and social action, and that's um, part of what we are as Christians, what we're called to be. Um, with your permission, I'd love to say a brief prayer, and then we'll repair to the lobby outside. So, Father, we thank you so much for one another. We thank you for the resources you place in our hands. Protect us, Lord, from the, the pitfall of pride. We can create nothing, Lord. You are the creator. You are the creator of, um, of wealth. All things come from you. Help us to be aware of that and to be responding responsibly to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all very much for coming. Please do stay if you can.